This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. It is hour three of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks. We are uh, we're coming to you live from the great south coast. We are now going out to the west coast, where we find our next guest. He is, of course, uh, the great MTC, the great renaissance man, and this is his music. Just a little bit here. It's called Mother Freedom. Yeah, who's that guy? Your way. Ow. Music, man. Who is that guy? <laughs> Love that guitar sound, man. That is the great Mark Taylor Canfield, the great musician, the Renaissance man here on the Jeff Santos Show, and of course, the Democracy Watch News. <laughs> And right here on the program itself, wow. here every Friday. Love it, man. You are uh, rocking in the free world. Wow, that sounds so great. Um, over the airwaves, I'm, I'm digging it. It tells me that uh, it's a good mix, so I'm glad that that's the one that we're releasing. So, And we were like... <laughs> <laughs> we're all like playing in the studio. You were just strumming the guitar earlier, right? <laughs> well, nothing like a good mix. Yeah, we were and, uh, and the vocals are great, too. Uh, little backup vocals. I love it, too. It's a great, great... Uh, well, you got a good band, it my man. Even on the cell phone. Yeah, even on the tiny cell phone speakers, it sounded pretty good, which is really like the test, right? Because a lot of people listen to their music on tiny little earbuds or laptop speakers or their cell phones. So you got to make it sound good on the on the lowest fidelity speakers, you know, as well as the high fidelity speakers. But I am seriously, I'm so glad to talk to you, but I'm seriously sleep deprived. Like, this is crazy. Last week it was because I was in the recording studio trying to master those songs and get those released. And this week, it's because I'm trying to get ready for this international global live stream event, which is like a 24-hour event, and it's um, I'm doing all these all-night sessions trying to get the tech ready for that. You know what it's like to try to do live uh, video and live stream like that. It really takes a lot of preparation, a lot of oh yeah, a lot of practice and technical um, preparation. So, but uh, my performance is going to be some. Original music, and then I'm going to talk for a little bit about the healthy aspects and the positive aspects of music and its positive influence on the world. And I'm sure to mention Bob Marley in that respect. But it's a 24-hour series of events, Jeff, and it's featuring speakers like the famous physician and clown Patch Adams, which I'm really looking forward to. I really want to hear what he has to say. And it's all free. It's called... The Global Happiness Summit, and it's an attempt by all sorts of people, all sorts of presenters, PhD doctors, psychologists, yoga teachers, artists, comedians, musicians, who just kind of want to help heal the world. And and I'm think, I was kind of thinking of John Lennon would appreciate this. I know Yoko Ono does because I sent her a link to this, but I, we just want to help embrace you know a more positive attitude and to help heal the world and and do some life-affirming uh, work that can move us forward right now. So I'm very honored to be asked to participate with such a distinguished cast of characters in this. And um, uh, if you go to Eventbrite, um, then you can register for all the online events, and they're all completely free. Everything is free. And uh, I think it's, you know, something that Patch Adams really likes um, because he's, you know, his Gazundag Institute, I think, has been going on for about 50 years now or something. So he's been around for a long time. Of course, everybody's familiar, I think, with the film where Robin Williams played him. But he's a real guy, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. But um, it's, a, it's, it's sort of an international stage, and I'm really looking forward to it. I really, I really want to get all this tech stuff worked out and do some of the stuff that I saw here in Seattle during the Mopop, uh, the Museum of Pop Muse, uh, Culture, uh, tribute to Alice in Chains, where you had Ann Wilson, but also been communicating with lately. She's got some cool stuff on. I want an autographed uh, vinyl version of her song, 
uh, the revolution starts now because that is great. It comes out on this red vinyl, so cool looking, Jeff, and she'll actually autograph it for me if she can get some more pressings done. But I want to do more stuff like that. I've, I've been kind of dragging my heels about live streaming and thinking, you know, I just want to be out on the clubs. But, you know, it could be a while. And I've got to accept that and be realistic. So I'm going to try to embrace the live streaming and the fact that these people gave me this opportunity to have an international audience is really a great thing for my career and for my music. So I'm going for it. I've been preparing for days, just trying to get my studio all set up so that I could do some nice audio during it and making sure that I'm working with the organizers to let it all go smoothly. But I'm also going to be participating in some of the other events that are going on because there's some really interesting people that are presenting all sorts of different ideas about how people can pursue happiness, part of the Declaration of Independence, right, the pursuit of happiness, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So some times over the last year, I think some of us have kind of forgot that what that means, and we're trying to remind people that, especially with the arts and music and the healing arts, there's a lot of ability to kind of transcend the daily rigors that we all go through, and we all got to find a way to kind of like help heal ourselves and heal our, heal our society too. And this country, especially after the last four years, we don't even need to go there, I guess. You, you and I have been talking about that since the whole sort of right wing took over. But, hey, I do have some good news from Seattle. The, uh, there was a city ordinance that was approved by the Seattle City Council and signed into law by Mayor Ginny Durkin that requires all the local grocery stores with at least 500 employees in the city to pay the frontline grocery workers $4 an hour extra in hazard pay. Oh, wow. So That is a great thing. That was cool. And then, guess what? Of course, uh, the Northwest Grocery Association and the Washington Food Industry Association, the lobbyists, went to court to try to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? I mean, you do guys, you do guys as Starbucks and Jeff Bezos, so, I mean, I guess you can only expect so much, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so there was a legal battle, but the good news is, is one thing, City Attorney Peoples, who I talk about a lot, he was the first guy in line when the first uh, legal pot shop opened up in Seattle. He was the first guy in line. He's our city attorney, and he wanted to buy weed. That's the, what this guy is like. He is out there on the front lines for the grocery workers now, and he was quoted as saying that it's a that because the judge turned down the appeal... Judge Kugenauer, who he's done some really interesting decisions over the years about especially civil rights and labor, labor rights. But he said, he, uh, Holmes, who gave me his personal card and put his personal cell phone number on the back of it, by the way, that's the kind of guy he is, this uh, statement that said, this is a big win for grocery store employees who have been critical and vulnerable frontline workers since the start of the pandemic. We brought strong legal arguments to, to prevail, and I'm thankful to the Assistant City Attorney Jeremiah Miller for seeing us through to a victory. So... The ordinance now will stand and will last throughout the pandemic. And that's something I've been saying for a long time. And I told you the story about a friend of mine who works in one of these major grocery chains who literally had to apply for EBT benefits because he just wasn't making ends meet with the high rents in Seattle and the low minimum wage. So anybody, by the way, who opposes the minimum wage from here on out, I'm just going to assume that they actually are then endorsing and supporting poverty. And I cannot make any other conclusion at this point. Yeah, well, we got to escape poverty. Um, you know, I want to I want to get into um, something I think is really important here. Uh, is you have a, a really great leader. We've been talking about her on this show, Miss Salant, uh, for a number of years, and it was you who brought me to the attention. Uh, and and uh, now there is, uh, I think, more and more national, um, you know, views of her, particularly taken on. Uh, Bezos and the fight, and, and of course the money that was put in to defeat uh, uh, Ms. Swan. And of course she won, and um, others, um, you know, friend of Robert Reich as, as well, um, a protege of Mr. Reich. And I want to get your thoughts on where do you see her moving forward? Is is she a candidate for mayor? Is she going to look at uh, the state house to the south of you there in Olympia? Is there is there going to be a uh, uh, a movement for her to uh, to look at a at a congressional seat? I'm not sure what your rules are in your state. If you have to live in the congressional district, which of course would probably be Jayapal's, uh, where Ms. Sawant lives now, but uh, you can can you run for an adjacent district and still live in Seattle proper? Uh, what's your take there? Well, there's a lot of different elements to this. 
Um, first of all, Shama Sawant has been a national and international figure for a long time now. And I became very aware of that because I did a piece on her that was then published in the India First Post, which is a major uh, newspaper in India. And if I hadn't been covering Shama Sawant, I'm, they would not have been interested. But she is from that part of the world. She is of um, South Asian descent, and so is Pramila Jayapal. Um, they are very close, so I don't think that they want to compete for the same seat in the U.S. Right, Congress. Right. However, there's no reason why she can't run for uh, the state uh, legislature, and that would be an, a good step up, too. Or maybe she has other plans. I don't know, Jeff. I think right now she's really focused on trying to extend the eviction moratorium in Seattle, which has kept a lot of people from being thrown out into the streets and becoming homeless. And that's kind of, her focus is very local and very Seattle-oriented most of the time. So I think she would really have to take some time and think about what that next step would be. Right now, I think she's in the middle of so many, you know, economic and health crises and, um, you know, anti-labor crises happening in Seattle right now that uh, her hands are full. Uh, I haven't heard her talk about running for national office, um, but she's been a national figure and she's gotten national coverage and, as I said, international coverage ever since she was first elected. And just amazing everybody by being Richard Conlon, who was a long-term incumbent in, on the Seattle City Council. He had been there forever, it seemed, ever since I moved to this town, it seems like. And, you know, kind of a middle-of-the-road kind of guy, a little bit like uh, what we see with Joe Biden at times. And, and I, I was listening to the program earlier, and I was just thinking that when we were watching the debates, and it was Bernie versus Biden, um, it was very, very clear to all of us that Biden is an establishment candidate, and in a lot of ways, he's not really that interested in moving the ball forward too far, you know. I mean, he certainly uh, does not consider himself to be aligned with democratic socialism. Well, that's so, for sure. I, mean, <laughs> I don't, you, I don't have to, he doesn't have to go that far, but I'll, 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 take, him, I'll, I'll take him, you know, at a halfway measure to, uh, you know, to get his halfway to, to single-payer health care. Uh, he can get his uh, halfway to free college uh, yeah. university. I mean, at least meet his halfway. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying right now is that, well, oh, we can't go there. That's too hard. Let's not, uh, let's not do a, a whole filibuster. Let's just have a talking filibuster. Like, please, a talking filibuster. So, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. There's a... Uh, you know, getting back to, to uh, the, the great city councilor, uh, you know, a lot of talk uh, within um, online community and so forth uh, about some uh, splintering with, with AOC, but they're on the same team, it seems, and, you know, they may have different ways of, of uh, addressing issues, but uh, I don't see to be too much separation between uh, both of them. Well, they're both a part of a democratic socialist movement, and the socialist alternative... Uh, which is the party that uh, Shama Sawant is, is a member of and has been a, a leading spokesperson for, for a long time. They've also ran candidates in other local elections across the country in places like Minneapolis, by the way. So they and the Democratic Socialists of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, they actually are working together at this point, at least through Shama Sawant, because she announced recently that she had joined the DSA, and even though she's been uh, uh, the spearhead for a lot of these $15 an hour minimum wage, eviction moratoriums, corporate tax on Amazon, you know, leading a lot of these charges and these progressive issues, she actually is a member of the, uh, the Socialist Alternative Party. So that's been, she's been very loyal to them and not, not loyal, actually, to the Democrats. But at this point, I think it's very clear that the way that she's uh, risen to the the uh, pro the position of power that she has in the community is because she's very good at organizing the grassroots. She understands that it's not about her political allies who are the big donors. It's actually the people out on the streets uh, who show up at the city council meetings and pack the chambers when they really want to get a vote passed, do a lot of talking to the media and protesting in order to get things done in this town. I think, you know, she led a protest, and I was there. I performed some music during this. Uh, she led a protest during the Black Lives Matter protests and, and that whole chop movement into the Seattle City Hall. 
So she's not against turning to the streets in order to get support. And I think that's not, she's the only person on the council that I can see who is able to do that. And that takes a lot of community participation. You literally have to get out in the, in the community and have community meetings and meet with people at coffee shops and find out what's going on. First of all, you can't, you know, hide away in your ivory tower at city hall. And I think she's been able to build coalitions. And then also, it's very clear to me that the democratic socialists that she's worked with, have, or at least her, her particular style, is much more of a coalition building kind of style. It's a, it's, it's more of a coalition style government idea where you, you work together with other groups on certain issues where you can agree. And then it helps your movement uh, move forward as well. I mean, you know, people asked her, why did you spend so much time um, trying to uh, save the Showbox Theater, which is still open, by the way, and, and are scheduling shows at this point. So that building has survived. And um, the response was, she wasn't really t- talking publicly about this, but I know that her response was that what you do is you work with everybody in the community and you build bridges and you build networks and coalitions and that builds your movement as well so the musicians and the artists in town then started wondering about democratic socialism maybe that's a a, a relatively sane and rational approach at this point instead of not understanding politics or getting involved in politics at all which a lot of artists are prone to do they're either in my, in my experience, artists are usually very political or not political at all. They're co- completely yeah. Apolitical. They're one or the other. They but either go all in or they're 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 talking, you know, about uh, more money for themselves. <laughs> well, 150 bands and artists across the country signed a petition demanding that the showbox be given historical preservation status, historical landmark status. So, when you align yourself with a movement like that, you can't really lose. Now you've got people in major bands across the country that uh, know that you're on their side, so they might be much more interested in supporting you Where before that issue came up. So issue-oriented politics sometimes works really well, coalition-style bridge building, her coalitions with uh, small businesses and labor unions has always been pretty effective. All of these groups and organizations obviously have their own agendas and their own goals, but on particular issues, they can work together, and that tends to be very effective when it comes to local city politics in Seattle, at least. You can actually, like I said, pack the chambers. It's actually a form of democracy. By the way, I have my democracy vouchers. The city of Seattle's um, elections are um, publicly funded, and that came through an initiative by the people. It was a city initiative that made that happen. And so I was sent uh, $100 in vouchers that, that I can spend on any campaign I want, and it's public money. Basically, I give those vouchers or send them to the campaign of my choice, uh, candidate of my choice, and they're able to cash them, and they get that money from the public coffers to, to cover their campaign. So I think it's a great idea. They're called democracy vouchers, and I would like to see that become a model for other cities across the country as well, because it gives people a a direct say in who gets the funding for their campaigns rather than it coming from Amazon <laughs> and major right. corporations and Boeing and Microsoft here. So, Hey, let me people, ask you to, to you take know. a, I think you're, you're, you're great on that. Um, uh, how has the, the Floyd uh, situation and the court case there, I know there haven't been that many protests, maybe outside of Minneapolis. Uh, are you guys monitoring that? What is the scene on the streets, which you monitor so much? Uh, in terms of um, in, in terms of that court case going on there, uh, we had on um, uh, yesterday both Herb Boyd and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Justin Blake, who of course is the uncle of Jacob Blake, who was shot seven times in the back and is now paralyzed. Um, is there uh, a scenario where um, you know you think that there will be more um, you know protest in the street? Uh, in Seattle, uh, how much are they paying attention to this, from Black Lives Matter to others? Well, first of all, you know, kudos to you for putting those voices on the air yesterday because it's Thank very you. powerful and very important. Um, I, uh, my heart goes out to the family, and I can only imagine because we were talking about the original death here in Seattle of John T. Williams, the woodcarver that started the whole Justice Department review of the Seattle Police and has eventually led to 
some legislation that is slowly chipping away at this uh, un- unaccountability, um, lack of accountability that has developed with the law enforcement. Um, but we're still having uh, accusations of racism. We just had a Pierce County sheriff who was accused of uh, racial profiling. We've had uh, more deaths of young men of color. Um, the, we were talking about this the other day at our, our Democracy Watch News press briefing about how the Seattle Police Department is kind of a bunker mentality. They may literally have built bunkers around the police precincts, um, big concrete walls. It's just crazy. Um, you don't really see a lot of police hanging out in the community that much, you know? Uh, they, it's not that they're not showing up when, you know, they choose, but it's, I just, I don't know. The relationship with the community is tentative at best. Um, the new police chief that took over for Carmen Best, uh, the former police chief, uh, hasn't really improved the situation that much. And there's still a lot of tension around City Hall uh, about the mayor's, Mayor Jenny Durkin, the former U.S. attorney in the Obama administration, how she actually has sided with the police um, when confronting protesters and things like that. We're still having court battles over trying to ban the use of very dangerous crowd control control munitions, which I've testified against at city council hearings. Some of them are military-grade and military surplus weaponry that the police department's got through the the war on drugs and some of that really bad thorough legislation um, that Joe Biden was a part of, unfortunately. I'm glad he recognizes that, that now that it was a mistake, but it led to um, partly the militarization of a lot of local police forces, which yeah, then no, I, I, only I, I, gave I can... them a um, more sense of invulnerability, you know, in terms of yeah. dealing with the community. So. I, uh, I want to get you, because there's about uh, 60 seconds left here, uh, quickly on the uh, <laughs> Joe Biden uh, asking for the resignation of these young people who smoke pot in the White House. I don't think they would fl- that would fly very well in Seattle if he was mayor of Seattle or governor of, Ka- of Washington State. Uh, any quick thoughts on that before we roll? If you said that to most people in Seattle, they'd probably just light up a joint right there just to prove it. So. <laughs> well done. It's well ridiculous. <laughs> that, it that ridiculous. He's out of touch. That's why I said yeah. young people really see Joe Biden as somebody who's a little bit out of touch on certain issues. He just yeah. He's an older generation. He's an older man. He, they really he just like Governor Inslee said, you know, the sooner they turn over... Uh, the organs of government to the younger generation, the better off we'll all be, especially when it comes to issues like climate change. Well, I think that's uh, exactly the case, and uh, and that's going to be a, a big test. But what has come over the last 30 or 40 years, you have to catch up with, and Joe Biden's got a lot of uh, education uh, to learn on. Uh, hey, uh, so great to talk to you, my friend. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you over the next couple of weeks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend. Again, you can find out more at MTC yeah, Online. Check out Thanks. the global... Check out the Global Happiness Summit and listen to Patch Adams and watch me play music and talk about my stuff. It'd be great to join you all online. And take care, Jeff. We'll see you next week. You guys rock. See you next week, my friend. Uh, thank you. And you always rock, my man. You always rock. Hey, folks, uh, I want to uh, I want to tell you we're going to be off uh, next Monday and Tuesday, and we'll see what the rest of the week brings. Uh, we'll keep you informed, of course, at RevolutionRadioNetwork.com. I want to thank uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Uh, Ron Kreider, for producing the broadcast today. Uh, we are uh, always, always in debt to him and what he does every day on this program. Keep on fighting, folks, peacefully. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. We'll talk to you midweek next week. Enjoy it. My name is Jeff Santos, and it's my time to say I gotta go.